Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I see of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. But what actually happened on the 5th of November? What was the gunpowder plot? Who was Guy Fox? And why do people who live on the internet wear masks with his face on them? The answers to these questions are actually a lot simpler than one might think. Let us travel back to 1604, to England and the reign of the Protestant King James I, who also happened to be King James VI of Scotland. Ever since Henry VIII broke from Rome, the persecution of Catholics in England was widespread. Though James's ascension to the throne was initially welcomed by many English Catholics in hopes of a lessening of persecutions, it presented a worrying state of affairs. James's predecessor Elizabeth had died childless, and James's ascension to the throne had been carefully negotiated with the Privy Council, who acted quickly in offering the throne to James in order to keep any potential Catholics from laying claim to the throne and marching on Westminster. With James being the first Protestant monarch in decades to have legitimate heir, English Catholics feared that the reign of Protestant monarchs would stretch out from then until the cracks of doom. Something would have to be done. Enter Robert Catsby, an English Catholic of noble heritage and frequent member of Catholic rebellions against the English monarchs. He and his friends Thomas Winter and John Wright all knew that if they were going to get a Catholic back on the throne, they would not only need to take out King James, but the Privy Council as well. Their plan was a simple one detonate a massive stockpile of gunpowder underneath the Palace of Westminster while the state opening of the House of Lords was occurring, taking out the King, the Privy Council, and any other people of significance in one fell swoop. They initially looked for support from Spain, but Spain felt another war with England was probably not worth the hassle at this stage. While they were looking for help from the Spanish, they managed to recruit two new members to their plot. Guy Fawkes, who hailed from York but had spent many years fighting in Flanders, and Thomas Percy, who was John Wright's brother-in-law. In June of 1604, the conspirators rented a house across the River Thames from Parliament under the guise of being Thomas Percy's base of operations in London. Their initial plan was to tunnel under the river and under Parliament and detonate the gunpowder in the tunnel. The conspiracy grew in numbers as the tunneling went on. However, the process was slow and difficult for a bunch of country gentlemen with a little experience of manual labour, and it was eventually abandoned. The conspirators returned to the country over the winter while Parliament was on break and returned back to London in March of 1605 with the new plan. Thomas Percy had managed to secure the lease of an undercroft, a type of vaulted storage room underneath the Palace of Westminster. It is important to remember that back in 1605, Westminster Palace did not look like this. It looked like this. It was a maze of different buildings that had been constructed over the centuries that included halls, chapels, chambers, workshops, stables, inns and taverns. Fox was appointed managers of the Undercroft, and using the alias John Johnson, he slowly built up a large store of roughly 36 barrels of gunpowder, hidden under a pile of coal and sticks. The conspirators had played their cards well. To the casual observer, the Undercroft was a simple store of fuel that the good Thomas Percy was building up for the winter. Now all they had to do was wait for Parliament to reconvene on the 15th of November. Guy Fawkes would light the fuse, escape on a boat waiting in the Thames, and tell Catholic Europe what had happened. Meanwhile, Catsby and the others would launch a popular revolt in the Midlands and capture James's daughter Elizabeth to install on the throne. All they had to do was wait. However, when one has time to wait, one has time to think, and when one has time to think, one has time to overthink every detail. Cracks and doubts began to develop in the minds of the conspirators. Many of them were concerned that the mass killing would damn their immortal souls to hell and that they would kill several innocent Catholics who were in and around the area. Many of the conspirators had relatives and friends that worked in Westminster and felt uneasy that they might be in the palace when the explosion occurred. As time went on, the doubts in the minds of the conspirators grew and the resolve started to waver. On the 26th of October, 1605, one of the members of the House of Lords, the Viscount Monteagle, received anonymous a letter at his house advising him that maybe being in Parliament in the next few weeks wasn't the best idea and if he could not be there and also burn that letter, that'd be great. Monteagle, however, did not heed the letter's advice and he wrote straight to the Privy Council and to the Secretary of State, the Earl of Salisbury. 
Salisbury was already suspicious of things going on around Westminster, but wasn't 100% sure of what the letter was suggesting. As a result, he decided to wait and see how things developed. The conspirators were also notified of the letter soon after by Montego's servant Thomas Ward. Though no one knows who penned the letter, many assume it was a conspirator called Francis Thresham who was Montego's brother-in-law. Tresham managed to convince his co-conspirators that he was not the letter's author, but he strongly advocated abandoning the plan. His pleas were ignored and the plot went ahead. Salisbury showed the letter to King James when he arrived back in London on November 4th. From the letter's wording, the King and Salisbury deduced that some sort of explosion was about to occur and ordered an immediate search of Westminster Palace and the surrounding areas. The initial search found nothing, but they did encounter Fox tending the Undercroft with the hidden gunpowder. However, the searchers bought Fox's cover story as Thomas Percy's servant. When this was reported back to Salisbury though, he was not so convinced. He knew Percy to be a Catholic agitator, and along with King James, he ordered the Undercroft searched again later that night. There, they found Fox dressed in full riding gear, holding a lantern and a pack of matches. A closer inspection of the Undercroft revealed the gunpowder and Fox was arrested on the spot and brought before the King on November the 5th. News of Fox's arrest spread quickly, causing the conspirators in London to flee to the Midlands, where they tried in vain to start their revolt. Fox was subjected to torture on the rack, and after two days of agonizing torment, he revealed the names and the locations of his co-conspirators. The remaining conspirators were hunted down in Worcestershire, where, on November the 8th, those still alive were captured. They were sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered, and the gunpowder plot was brought to a close. The gunpowder plot is commemorated as Bonfire Night or Guy Fawkes Night in the United Kingdom, where effigies of Guy Fawkes are burnt in bonfires and fireworks are set off. And that's about everything. Oh, right, these guys. These guys may be wearing Guy Fawkes masks, however, they're not aligned with Guy Fawkes in any way. They're wearing the masks because of the film V for Vendetta, where the main character is an anarchist who also wears a Guy Fawkes mask. And the goals of the original Guy Fawkes and of these guys could not be more further apart. And that, dear viewer, is probably as good a point as any to end this video. Thank you very much for watching, and if you like, make sure to subscribe and share. Thank you very much.